Good afternoon, Dean. I'm thrilled to be up here with you, and thank you for being here with us. Yeah, I got you. Um, so to begin, as the CEO of a private business, you don't necessarily have the same expectations that a public business would have with shareholders and things like that, yet you're, as, as mentioned, doing some of these things by choice. So tell us just a little bit about your journey and how you started to think about your legacy at McKinstry. Sure. Well, we um, started out 60 years ago as a plumbing company, and uh, you know everyone needs plumbing and now air conditioning and a few other things, clean water. Um, first half of my career and of the years that we were in business were somewhat transactional, if, you know, not necessarily in a bad way. Um, that was the role we were in. And uh, it's always a little harder at the start, you know, to make a living and you're sometimes uh, going from um, job to job, right. hand to mouth, whatever, however you want to call it. And I think as we became more successful, we really pivoted to trying to, you know, become, you know, whether it be through exemplar or scale, be able to make a difference in things that we cared about. So we sometimes joke, you know, that, you know, first you'll have to figure out how to make a living, then you gotta have to figure out how to make a difference. And so I think a lot of times companies build those sort of strategies up around, um, you know, always trying to rationalize them around profitability or how it's gonna to relate to profitability or brand or attendance or valuations. And that's not irrelevant. I, you know, run a capitalistic business. We've grown from four, million a year when I got there to a billion a year now. So, you know, revenue's going up, margins going up is a good thing. But I think it was really, you know, empowering to think about, you know, getting to spend a fair amount of your life on things that you are passionate about and you care about and that you worry about. And it's very empowering, not only as a leader, but certainly for all of our customers and all of our people. So we've got 3,000 people who get up thinking that they're gonna work hard on something they really believe in and that they worry about and they think they're gonna be able to make a difference in. And so we don't really do it for profit. Most profit is sort of a consequence of how you do what you do. Um, you know, not necessarily the goal. Um, although it's in there somewhere. But that's really how we, how we got to it. I love that. So now you're showing that you can make a living and a difference at the same time. You don't have to, yeah. That's, that's the idea, <laughs> yeah. Usually it goes in reverse order. You know, I think sometimes people say, Great, look back in your year, look back in your life and go, wow, you know, we did all these things that we set out to do and while we're at it, we made a difference. We like to do it the opposite way and say like, well, what are the things that we're good at and what are, what are the problems in the world or the opportunities in the world that we should aim that at? So we start with the aspiration and the aim and then let that turn into sort of a business objective direction. So speaking of all the problems in the world, we've heard of a ton that we can tackle. You have chosen three, that when, in our discussion, three pillars. Mm -hmm. These included climate, affordability, and equity. Tell us a little bit about why, of all the, the things to tackle, you've chosen those three, why you feel passionate about tackling those first. Yeah, we're kind of like a communist country. We write a five-year plan every five years, you know, and then we try, try to map to that. And we start with a really broad view of, you know, what are all the big problems, what are the big opportunities, what are the trends, what's happening in our industry, what's happening in the world, what's happening in our communities. And then, you know, we usually find, you know, plenty of things to worry about or to dream about or to want to have happen. And we then try to pick the ones that most relate to the kind of things that we do for a living and where we have skills and domain expertise. So climate is really important to us uh, as humans and as citizens, uh, but we're also uh, in the infrastructure business and innovating the infrastructure business around the country is a thing we do for sustainability. So we think that climate, climate change, decarbonization, electrification is an area of, that we think of as a huge problem. So we, we built our business strategy around that being a thing we could make a difference on. And we worry about the front edges of that in terms of you know, severe weather and impact on uh, low resource uh, people around the planet in our own country. And then of course the, the, the potential of the magnitude of that scaling uh, scares us a lot about our kids and our grandkids and the rest of the folks in the community. Affordability really stems more from, you know, we, we design and build and operate and maintain buildings all around the country um, to the tunes of thousands a year. You know, we operate 10,000 buildings all across America. And so we, we know that every year what we do costs more, and a lot of it comes from a lack of innovation. By the time we get ready to build a building, everybody's in a big hurry. And uh, some of the innovation can drop out of a project. We sometimes joke that, you know, you know, projects are where innovation go to die. And of course, that's not quite true. Um, but we, we really want, to that. We, you know, we take, it, you know, sometimes in the design, build, operate, maintain world, it, it unfortunately takes a really big village to raise a child. And that brings along sort of misalignment and inefficiencies in those silos. So we think we can make a difference in that. And we know that 
affordability is important all up and down the stack, and it has a direct relationship to the environment because when projects cost too much, it's hard to be able to afford to make them as awesome as they should be. And if we're going to get to zero energy and zero carbon on these buildings, we have to find other things to not spend money on so we can get that done. And then lastly, um, you know, the, we all dream of a fair and just and equitable world. We all work at it, but we all know that we don't have such a thing. And uh, so, you know, we prioritize that because it's the right thing for our communities and we have a debt of burden of the opportunity we've had and the success we've had to make our company and the industries we work in um, promote equity. Uh, so those are the three things that we build our business plans around and we work on those as opposed to other drivers that a publicly traded company might have to do in their boardroom. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, so when we spoke and, and met in the beginning, I, I was really taken by your honesty, your authenticity, and just, you know, in some ways maybe vulnerability that, you know, we're not perfect, but we're trying, you know, and that's hard for, for CEOs. So tell me a Good little thing bit. I don't have a boss. <laughs> as I said, it's here for private companies. Yeah. Why, why honesty is important in this conversation and why collective action mm -hmm. is important? Yeah, I spent a third of my time in philanthropy and, and uh, nonprofits, mainly in children's health, education, and global health. And so I, I honed my skills in, in building collective action because the one thing about nonprofits is nobody owns them or everybody owns them. So you have, to, you have to learn to figure out how to deliver collective action and bring people along in yeah. collective action. So our favorite you know, proverb at McKinstry is if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And so we do occasionally sprint and go fast and uh, grab a couple people and do something really to go somewhere quickly. But our real, the power in what we do is, is never forgetting that we're going to bring everybody along. And that includes everybody at our company and everybody in the communities that, uh, where we work. Um, and, you know, we're working on hard problems and we're, you know, somewhere slightly above average and we're doing our very best. We make plenty of mistakes, but we are passionate um, about making a difference and we uh, have a real sense of urgency uh, in what we do. Again, I love the authenticity and just the honesty of, uh, around the, those conversations. And as part of our conversation, we discussed, of course, you know, collective action is important, but it's probably fair to say most people in this room are pretty competitive. Uh, naturally, but you, you mentioned something to me and I quote, don't surrender the things that make your brand unique, but also don't squander the opportunity for collective action. So why that? Why this? Well, nobody here doesn't love sport and, uh, you know, I think sports sometimes um, can be seen as, you know, a, a nice to have as opposed to a must to have in a lot of communities. But I don't think anybody in this room believes that, and I don't, I don't believe that. You know, so I, you know, I'm a big sports fan. You know, I'm, I'm from Seattle, so, you know, go Kraken, you go Seahawks, go Mariners, come back Sonics. Um, you know, when, uh, when I think about those organizations and their brand position, you know, they, they're working hard with really bright people to engage their constituencies, their ticket holders and the, and the viewers. And... Um, and they do it in unique ways and they're competitive. You know, I don't think, you know, yeah. there, there might be some sharing going on in all these leagues, but generally speaking, when they get out on the, on the, on the pitch, they're, they're looking to win. Right. Um, so on the other hand, you know, if we're going to get somewhere, we have to balance that with collective action. And I think what's interesting and in advice I would give sports teams and venues, not that I'm qualified to do that, by the way, but, you know, I think you have the natural collective act action body group already, your natural constituency are people who love you, love your brand, love your, your players, love what you stand for and stick by you even when you don't win. So you have already built these incredibly durable collective action bodies and as you live out the values of your owners, your team, your players and your community, you've got the built-in partnership and so I think, you know, don't want to squander that. That's what helps make your enterprise successful and your impact greater. And then if you can come together at GSA and other kinds of places and share ideas that don't dilute your brand, but on the other hand, enhance it in this sort of collective uh, effort, then I think the power of sport can be a real leader in getting action to happen faster in climate. So one more question. I know we have a few seconds, but what would you tell other leaders or CEOs about the power that they have, the responsibility that they have to make these changes? 
Yeah, well, I mean, everybody has a different set of constraints, you know, and I was laughing and happy about some of the constraints I don't have, and I <laughs> certainly respect that different kinds of organizations are operate differently, funded differently, have different capital structures, might be publicly traded, might be owned by one person, might be owned by a collection, and so on. So we all, we all can make excuses. You know, we, we looked at the other ones and wish we didn't have our weaknesses and had their strengths, but we got what we got. And so, you know, I think, you know, when you look back on what you do in your career, you know, you're going to mostly be thinking about the relationships you made and the impact that you had. Um, and you certainly want your, your team and your venues to be successful, but you want to you want to use that as a vehicle to make a difference. That's that's what's going to satisfy you. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's one person at a time um, setting that those kind of aspirations and being able to work on those things as a priority, you know, right behind your family. Um, I think, you know, my advice would be put your family first, maybe your health and your family first. Um, but I mean, those are the those are the big opportunities we have. We're blessed, you know. Like there's nobody in this room is struggling too hard to make a living, and so why don't we just struggle really hard to make a big difference? That would be my suggestion. Love it, Dean. Thank you for your leadership. Appreciate it. Have fun. <laughs>